So hi everybody, my name is Cindy Gay and today's lesson is going to be all about how I hooked the Village of Pemberville rug. Now if you don't know me, I'm a rug hooking artist and teacher in Northwest Ohio. I help rug hookers find their own voices, to find their own style and their own way of hooking without copying someone else's rug. And yeah, if that sounds like a monumental task, it's not impossible. Um, today's lesson, the Village of Pemberville, is probably my most famous rug. It's the rug that won me um, Best of Show at the Atha National, no, it was the McGowan, McGowan National Show in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania in 2000. in 2002 um, and that was really interesting mainly because it's an original design and from what the gals who were running the McGowan National Show what, what they told me was that my rug was the first original rug it wasn't a McGowan pattern and it was the first original rug that won best of show so that was a little overwhelming um, it was at Sauter Village. I got best of show there in People's Choice and an offer to buy it, which I politely turned down. It was too new. <laughs> the rug was too fresh. I was not ready to give it up. But the way it started, I signed up for a class at Sauter Village and it was with Pris Butler and it was how to design a rug. And you spent the four days working with her guidance in putting together a rug pattern. That was in August of 2001. And I worked all week on this design. I knew it was going to be about the village of Pemberville because this is a quaint little town population around between 1200 and 1300, which is quite small when I figure that the high school that I had graduated from had 1,600 kids, right? So a small population, everybody knew everybody, everybody knows everybody. Um, for the longest time, I was Bob's mom. And fast forward 10, 20 years, my son was asked if he was Cindy Gay's son. So I guess things change, right? So. I fell in love with the structure, the, the architecture of this village. It's on the Portage River and it's got the typical downtown district of buildings that are all connected. And there were certain ones that I was really attracted to. Let me see if I can get you here. Let me get you a better picture of what the rug looks like so that you can have something to look at. Um, all the buildings are connected together. The Beaker's General Store is sort of on the corner and is an anchor. The Town Hall, which is a red brick building, is across the street and divided by a street. Um, so it's kind of stands alone by itself. The house at the bottom was the house that we lived in and then the long skinny building is the railroad depot that is um, used at, as a meeting location for the historical society and is privately owned and beautifully restored. It's like a little museum inside of there. Um, in the background behind the buildings is Beth Lutheran Church and the water tower. When you're driving towards town, Northwest Ohio is incredibly flat. And when you're driving towards town, all I could see above the trees coming home would be Beth Lutheran steeple and the water tower. So I knew I wanted those at the top of the rug. Then there are two major roads that head north towards Perrysburg or Toledo, which is just to the north of us. And on one road, there was a farm that had sheep. And then on the other road, there was a farm that I particularly liked where they had black and white cows and they had the craggiest little trees. 
so I wanted those trees, the black and white cows, and the sheep in the background. I also wanted some fields because this is farm country. And in fact, the house we're in now, we are surrounded on all four sides by farm fields. So I wanted to be able um, to kind of get that feel of the spaciousness and the flatness of the country. So that's what I was looking for. So let me show you what I started out with. Okay, so let's go here and hopefully this will work. I'm having trouble getting these pictures to show up. There we go. Oh God, it worked. Okay, so this is a photograph that I took of G Beaker's General Store. I don't think it was the original picture that I took to develop the pattern because it was raining that day. And I remember that photograph had the edge of the umbrella across the top of it. So what I was looking for when I took photographs that day was really structure. So when I came back this day, and I wasn't particularly careful about the photograph, but I was more interested in the window detail. And I wanted to get a good picture with some shadows on it because when I took it in the rain, there wasn't any of that definition going on. There wasn't these shadows in the windows that I wanted to work from. Now, part of my motivation for hooking this rug or my challenge to myself when I hooked this rug was to do it without perspective. Okay, so the rugs themselves or the, the buildings themselves have just the front view other than Beth Lutheran. Beth Lutheran shows a little bit of perspective, but that was the only way I could get that shadow from the steeple on the roof. And I really wanted to show that. So how do you get depth without perspective? Well, you do it with color and you do it with value. So let's give this a whirl. I've got this set up to take a look at this building. I'm figuring we're gonna start at the top and I'm gonna work my way down, okay? Um, I don't think anything's happened since I looked at chat. I can see chat in, from this view. So if you have a question while I'm going, make sure you ask it. But I'm gonna start at the top and basically just work my way down, okay? So the main part of the building is hooked incredibly simple. I think it's a five or a six cut. I don't remember exactly. It looks more like a six when I look, see it over there. Um, it is a spot die. It's a tone on tone spot die, which I always do for bricks. Sometimes I'll bring in maybe another color depending on what kind of brick it is. But mostly these type of bricks are tone on tone. They don't have a lot of color in them but I'll do a spot die with three different values. And that's how I get this look of brick. And then it's just cut it and hook it. There's nothing fancy going on. I do have a shadow line that goes across the top and down the side because the picture or the building itself actually has like an indent. And so I wanted to put that shadow in there. Is that shadow line a little dark looking at it now, almost 20 years later? Yeah, it is a little dark. Am I gonna change it? No, it's just fine the way it is. And there's a shadow line across the top because I think the brick probably stuck out a little bit. There's usually like a molding across the top. But what makes this building really special are the windows. And I want to break them down for you so that you can see that they aren't hooked that with that much detail. They're not that particular, but there's a couple of things that make them jump right off the building. And that's that dark shadow line. So there's a dark shadow line that goes across the top of the window and down the right hand side. Hopefully it's showing the camera the same way to you as it is to me. Um, it goes down one side, okay? Then I faced it with white wool, except on the side where it's got the shadow and it's got a row of gray in there. 
there's a little bit of a pattern. I had to simplify it for the crown molding across the, the window. And then what gives it and makes it jump off the screen one more time is that really dark shadow on that on my left hand side. Hopefully you're seeing it on the left hand side. The window is filled in with my early version of window wool. wool. What I do now for window wool is much better than what this is. But this ain't bad, okay? But it is the window wool. There's the little um, limestone um, window sills there and I did some little outlining around it. Probably wouldn't do it that way today, but that's what I did then and it's just fine, okay? Working our way down, then we've got the, the sign for Beaker's General Store. Now, again, do, if I was hooking this today, I would be rehooking that because I think there's parts of the letters that aren't real clear. It's not real crisp. Again, it's just fine. But this building had to be this size and no smaller because you need five holes in order to hook, for instance, the letter E. You need, and it looks like I have six holes. So I have the white of the upper bar of the E, a row of green, the white for the middle bar, and then it looks like two rows of green, and then the white below it. So these, those are actually six um, rug warp threads high, okay? And I just kept blowing up the building until when I held it over my backing, I could see six holes over that letter. And then that's what I got through. Lily's saying, what cut is on the windows? Um, it's not small. Let me look up closer because I can't tell from there. I would think they're either, I think they're fives. They look like fives to me. So that's probably a number five cut. Most of the rug is done in, done in fives and sixes. Okay. Then I've got this little, what would you call that? Um, you know, just that um, trim piece at the top of the window. And I wanted to get that right. So what I was did is I fussed with it for a little bit and I had, um, I had a, uh, gradation swatch that I use to get this green right for this building. And so I had probably eight values to my disposal and I would just pick and choose what values I needed to make it work. Um, Elizabeth is saying, are the sign and the lettering in the same cut? Probably, yeah, just to make that easier. For sure. Then I've got this very distinct and unusual shadow that's on the window. So the way I did that, there's these big blinds that could be pulled down, which I don't think they're installed anymore. I haven't seen those blinds in years. But at the time, there was these blinds. And what was really cool is that everyone in town had these banners and for Memorial Day, 4th of July, Labor Day, those ba whoops, sorry, not camera. Those ban those banners would get hung from almost every porch in the village. And of course, Beaker's General had one hung above their window. And what was important to make it look ripply was to move the loops so that it's not a perfect row. I always say that if you're hooking realistically, it's better if your loops are a little bit wonky. If you have perfect soldier style loops, this would not look as realistic. It would look like a little cartoon hanging over the window. So Norma is asking, she says, so no deliberate shading on the window glass, just done by the wool itself. For the most part, I had a couple different values. I had a really dark value, which you see behind the woman holding the baby and in the open doorway behind the man. 
and then I had a lighter window value, and then I had a, something for the window shade. So there's the window shade without shadow, the window shade with shadow, and then the window, and then when the building itself was casting a shadow on the window, it made the window glass even darker. So that's why that really dark is there. But what I did is I took the window wool that I had, and because this was a plate glass window, I wanted it to maybe look like maybe there's something in behind there. And I cut it and hooked it in the exact order it was. So it's kind of like the wool reconstructed in that area, just scrunched down. So that's probably the fanciest thing that I did um, for that um, was just hooking that window wall without, I keep my elbow keeps hitting that, sorry. Um, hooking that window wall without it moving around uh, and without hooking it in my usual, you know, either going around in a circle or going down and then up and then down and then up kind of a fashion is how I usually hook a window whichever way is simpler. But these were big plate glass windows and I wanted them to have that unusual look. So one thing I wanna put out is that notice at the very bottom of the building where it's meeting the sidewalk, there is a little dark sum in there. And I'm sure that's a number two. I bought a number two cutter so that I could cut these really fine strands that I pulled in after the fact. I don't hook with the two to fill in, but I'll grab a two because a two can fit anywhere, right? And I'll pull a two in as an accent at any time. So there's a little bit of shadow. Rule of thumb is whenever something vertical hits something horizontal, whenever the people's feet hit the ground, there's a slight shadow under their feet, okay? That's how they stand up and are away from the, the flat surface. Um, the other thing that I can mention is the shadow. I kind of went back after the fact and added these shadows after I'd had it hooked without shadows. Um, I was hooking with the house, which is down lower, and decided to put a lot of shad play with the shadows on that. And I thought, mm, I'm gonna add some shadows up into there. I have the shadow on the plate glass. So if it's bright enough for the sun to do that, it's gonna be bright enough to cast shadows from the people. Well, what does that look like? I don't know. You make them up. You kind of guess. If you have to, you get someone to stand at that time of day and take a photo of them and their shadow. Have them stand on concrete, that way you can see the shadow really clearly. But if they're on grass, then you can just hook it in the grass, right? So that added a lot to it, um, quite a bit. Let's take a look at the people. The people are done very simply. There's no eyes, there's no nose, there's no mouth. There's a little bit of shadowing and maybe something going on. Um, when you hook a woman in particular or someone with long hair and the hair comes down, there's always a darkness right in through here. So you want to hook that area dark. Um, she's holding a baby, which I think you can clearly see, but it's not really hooked so that it looks like a baby, right? Um, I did the blanket in this non-distrip descript kind of colorful because Jenny always made quilts for her baby. So that was, pro she was probably wrapped in a quilt. And then blue jeans. Take a look at how I hook the blue jeans on each person. Um, I used slightly different shades of blue, but they were all blue from sort of the same family. But I know where my light is coming from. And my light is coming from, in, in, in reality, it would be the upper right. So hopefully it shows up that way and it's not flipped on your screen, which it might be. But so on the left side of each leg is a shadow. There's no shadow on the right side because that's where the sun's coming in, right? And legs are just columns. 
simple columns, nothing unusual with that. Um, the man's arm, his would be his right arm is all in shadow because the sun's coming in from that particular direction. There's a little shadow underneath his left arm. Um, I'll often do a shadow across the belly if the person has a bigger belly and it would cast a shadow, right? The neck area is usually darker than what the face is. Um, hands are just little round, little round balls. Um, so that makes that whole process a little bit easier. Now, thanks Kim for the ID on the photo. Um, another thing to point out is the ground under the people. This is my technique for hooking sky just upside down and in a different color. Okay, so ground goes bright and dark at the front and gets lighter and duller as it moves back. I don't think I had a swatch for this. I think I just kind of grabbed and pulled whatever I had and kind of made it up as I went, but it is slightly different in the beginning. Let's see if I can, I know I am zoomed in. Well, I can zoom in this way. Let me zoom in a little bit more. There we go. So you can see that there's a slight, I mean, it's, it's subtle. There's not a whole lot of difference in the value, okay? But there is some differences. And as it moves up, it's in a way, it's getting slightly lighter. Um, and that's what helps it to move and, and turn and bend down. Now, another thing to look at is these evergreens that are on each side of the building. They're basically just a shadow on one side and then the evergreen in a very recognizable shape, okay? If you took these and put these in a landscape in someone's front yard, they would look like those kinds of shrubs. They're in like a pewter colored urn and I just wanted to show that it had some shape to it. So I just sort of identified some dark areas and some light areas and hooked it. And that is done. Um, Elizabeth is saying, is this done on rugboard? Yes, yes, that's my favorite backing, even though this was done in 2002. By then I was a diehard rugwarp fan and it is definitely done on rugwarp. So what other questions do you have? Did I cover everything in that building? I wanted, I figured going just from the top and working my way down was the best way to go about it. That's as far as the camera is right now. But that little banner, what did they call that? A bunting, I think they call that. That's one of my absolute favorite parts. And But look at it. It's not just red, white, and blue. See, there's a gray row, and you can probably see it a little bit better now that I'm in even closer. There's a gray area there, and the two reds don't match. And that's all good, okay? Okay, so what questions do you have? There's the rug, and unfortunately, it's there's a lot of camera equipment in the way in order to get this up close kind of a shot. What questions do you have? Or do you want to see anything else? Let's stick with just this building because I, if, if, unless you didn't like this video, but if you like this video and that walkthrough is something that was useful, then I'm going to go through the rest of the buildings over time and we'll do the same kind of detail on each of the buildings because there's a different lesson in each one. Is the grass a spot dye or a gradation? Probably not a gradation. Pro Let me go back to this photo. Um, I didn't have many gradations. I just kind of like put together what I had. So like the grass at the bottom 
of the rug on you know near the house that is definitely just random crap thrown together that was close um there might have been some leftover gradations but i didn't go this gradation is this grass nothing like that Elizabeth said, when you did the lesson on should you hook in a straight line, I see the architecture is linear, but the other items are more random. Is that correct? Absolutely. The only thing that really should be hooked. Where is that coming from? Is that coming from? No. I wanted to move in close, but now I'm, now I'm confused on which camera is which. Okay, let me get you. That's the webcam. Oh. Yeah, I, I'd lost track of which camera was which. Maybe this is it. No, that's the webcam that doesn't look very good. Um, Let's do this. Patrice says, I love this video. Would like to see more of it. Jess says, love the walkthrough. Very helpful. Okay, so we'll probably do more of them. So when you design one like this, do the buildings get placed where it works? Or are these buildings actually in this layout in real life? I hope this makes sense. No, they are not in you know, the perfect relation that they would be in. Um, oh, there's the camera angle I was looking at. So to go back to that question that you had about the grass being linear. You can see that the, the siding on the railroad station is dead straight across. And then the hooking for the stone area in front of it is more hooked like sky. That gives you a little bit more of a lesson on that. Um, the buildings do not. Um, our house would be, say, how can I describe this? Um, I'm sorry, I keep flipping around these cameras. I'm going to drive you all crazy. But if our house was here where I'm sitting, the town or the railroad depot would be to my left at the very end of the street. We were one house in from the corner. The town hall was about three blocks down the street. And then Beaker's is in like another two blocks going in the opposite direction. Um, Beth Lutheran Church is sort of in the middle of town inside the where the houses are away from the business, um, which is where the um, water tower also is so they're really yeah they're they were they were placed where it made good design sense they were blown up to sizes that made sense um beakers had to be big enough so i could hook the letters i wanted the rug to say beakers general store i knew i wanted that so i had to make that building that big this rug was going in a certain spot i could not make it any bigger than this wide i had from floor to ceiling but i could only go that wide so that's what i worked with so when i did the town or the railroad station the railroad station you can maybe do this so you can see a little bit of it the railroad station was stretched initially to be as big as from side to side and then it looked funny so i shrunk it down a little bit and left a little bit more on that what would it be its left hand side our right hand side where the big pine tree is it just felt awkward when it went from edge to edge so i shrunk it up a little bit and but i couldn't shrink it too much because i didn't want to lose the ability to hook some of the detail so there was a little bit of that going on D says, very interesting. Love seeing the close-up. Q 
Kimberly says, I'd be interested in a close-up and personal look at the top. Cow, sheep, water tower, too. I think I'll save that for another lesson. Maybe we'll do that part next. Did you trace the photo, then transfer to Rug Warp? I did. I, I have several videos out there. Some of them, I think, I know they're in the rug cooking journey. Um... Um, I did one on a dog where I traced my son's dog and I took you through step by step by step by step. That might be on YouTube. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but it is a matter of tracing and then you refine it and then I trace it again. It never seems, at least for me, to come out perfect the first time I trace it. It Because you have to understand what it is that you're drawing. And so it takes a couple of times. You have to be very gentle and very calm with yourself and just know it's gonna take you a long time to put this together. Trace it out, figure out what the important details are, look at what you got, can I hook it? No, go back, trace it again. Then it's a separate decision of what size goes where, okay? That's a completely different decision. And then rearranging. And once you rearrange, it's like, no, that's too big. Shrink that down a little bit, you know. So the biggest tip I can say on that is if you have an original, my original always gets a big O on it. So I've got all these copies of these photographs. My original has a big O on it. When I take that original and I put it on my copy machine and I shrink it down or I blow it up, I write the percentage on that piece of paper that I print out with the new size, right? Because later on, when I want it to be different, I can look at it and go, okay, this one was 125, let's try 120, okay? Otherwise, you're starting every single time from scratch. So I've learned some little tips sort of along the way, which I've been teaching inside the Design Your Own Landscape course that I'm working through with a few students. And that'll be something that'll be up and available sometime soon. Um, all textured wool or some solid? Mostly, well, a little bit of both. I prefer, if I were to do it today, it'd be 100% textures. I mean, it just that's just what's on my shelf back there. Um, but at that time, I had a lot, it didn't have the huge collection. So I had to, if I needed a wool, I could dye it. You cannot manufacture a textured wool, right? So textured wools to me are much more precious because they are what they are and you could never get them back again. Dyed wool, I can make that every day. I can dye the same wool every day, get very close results and continue on with that forever. But when it is a textured wool, it's either there or it's gone. Joyce says, this is very useful. It will be helpful to hear about the rest of the piece. Yeah, okay, so I think I'll do this again. So if I want to design one, I can cut and paste them to where it works for the layout, right? Yes, my main design tools. Okay, so I do use an iPad. Um, I use an app called Graphic. I bring the photo into graphic and I trace it in graphic. And then from there, I can blow it up to any size, export it and print it. You know, it's a whole long drawn out process. But if you don't have an iPad to work with, um, and I'm doing it that way, mainly to compensate for my wonky eye, I have trouble seeing up close. So looking through tissue paper can be incredibly difficult. What I would do to compensate is I would use very clear um, window plastic, the kind that they sell in the fall to put up over windows. Buy a roll of that, get the expensive stuff, the stuff that's really clear that you can see through, it disappears. Saran wrap, I've heard some people use that. It's too flimsy. You need the thicker stuff in my opinion. You're going to be spending some time on this. Let's get some tools and let's let's make this work instead of just cobbling it together. Um, but then I totally lost my train of thought. Okay, let's just go back to the thing. 
yes, you can paste them together. So I was answering Patsy's question. And then, yeah, you just move them around and you play around with it. Do I want a long, tall design? I did long, tall because that's the space I had to put the rug. That's no longer the case today, okay? It was designed for our prior house. So if you've got a big old giant wall, let the rug tell you. Does it make more sense to put them, stretch them out and make one street where, you know, they're all on one street? I don't know. Play with it and see what you come up with. It takes time to design a rug like that. Would love it if you do more videos on this rug, if you would do them on days that can be rewatched on YouTube. Yeah, well, we'll see how they come up in the schedule. It's nice to see the photo of the original building. One more question. Normally items in the foreground are bigger than those in the background, yet your home looks smaller. Is this something we do to make things fit? Yes, that's exactly it. Um, it was to make things fit um, and it was for the design. Um, if you look at how tall the railroad depot is, it's really short compared to Beaker's. I don't care, okay? We worry about some of the most silly things that in the long run, when you look at a successful rug, it makes no sense, okay? Um, it just depends on how you want this to read. I wanted this to be more like little baby vignettes, little scenes that just happened to be all in one rug. Deb says, yes, it's on YouTube. Fantastic tip to write down the percentage. Yeah, that's something I learned the hard way. How did you figure out how to choose the color for the road? Um, no roads in this, probably, you mean for the concrete? You, you just play with it. You play with it and you figure out what will work. Um, I, I teach something called the pinch test in the color planning course where you fold the wool and then you pinch it um, and you can pinch several layers of the same thing and get an idea of what it's going to look like hooked. Uh, because when you look at flat wool, flat wool does not look the same as it does hooked. Can you show me a sample of textured wools? Textured wool, well, I grabbed this. Textures wool is anything that's not solid. Okay, that's a texture. This is a texture. And I grabbed these only because this is the wool that I actually use to hook the, the, the blue part of the flag. So let the wool do the work. There's a suggestion of stars, but I didn't have to hook them. That's why I like texture wool instead of solid wool. Were all the minute details traced or added later? I saw a belt on the man standing in front of beakers. Was that planned or added afterwards for the detail? I wonder if you add detail as you go. Yeah, I usually do. I add detail. I'm looking, when I'm creating the pattern, I want the general gist of the rug or of the, the gist of what I'm doing. Like when I'm doing the pattern for the windows, I don't draw the trim around the windows. I know the trim's gonna be there. I just draw the window. It makes no sense to go over a thread or two and draw another line denoting. It looks better on a commercial pattern, but if it's a pattern for me, I know where those details go. So I don't mess with that. Um, Patsy says, I don't care either. I love this piece so much. That tree in the middle is to die for. Yeah, and unfortunately, that tree in real life lost its life two years ago, I think. That was the town tree. They would decorate it at Christmas. It got too big in front of the town hall, so they chopped it down. So it made me really sad. I was glad that we had moved away before that had happened because I love that tree in real life. And that is right in front of the town hall. But Elena, my granddaughter, who's standing in front of that um, 
see if I can see that detail and move up on it. Elena, who's standing here with a piece of yellow wool and she's shaking it to get her little black cat out of the tree. Um, the cat's name is Turtle because she looked like a turtle Sunday. My daughter had a dog named Dog. So I was really worried. I says, when these babies are born, you're not gonna call them girl and boy, right? <laughs> so she didn't, but I was a little nervous. But Turtle was a sweet cat, but she liked to disappear. And we had a pine tree that was similar to this in the yard next door to us. So Elena did do that and coax her cat out of the pine tree. It just wasn't that pine tree, but that works, right? Okay. Sonia said, could this rug also be called a story rug? It could be, um, although it doesn't really cover time. A lot of times when it's a story rug, it's more like, you know, here's where we lived when we were first married. You know, here's our trip to Egypt with the pyramids and here's this and then here's that. That's more of what I think of as a story rug. This is more like a point in time. Um, I don't know if, if it fits in a category. Elizabeth says, your rug inspires me to want to visit the charming town of Pemberville. I hope you do. Beakers is open and operating as a general store. It's one of the large, I, I haven't checked with him lately to see if he's the oldest um, continuously operating general store. Never been shut down. It still has... Um, uh, chairs where the soldiers would come in and get their boots fitted um, before they left for war. And yeah, it is, you know, the the sill when you walk in the door, the limestone is all wore out and it's got that wonderful um, smell to it of age. But what he sells in there are Christmas year round and then what I call new antiques. They look, the reproductions, they look like the antique but they're new. So if you're going to get like a metal canister, it's the best possible. It looks like an old canister, but the inside is pristine and clean. That's my idea of using that antique look. A lot of antiques you really can't use because they're not practical. He sells the ones that are a little bit more practical. Norma says, I'm in love with the scroll at the top. When did you decide to add it? Um, towards the end, I had originally wanted this to look like it was in an antique car frame with tortoise shell inlay and because I had a frame like that and I wanted to duplicate that and I bought the thickener from ProChem to, that I thought I could play around with and I could paint the tortoise shell inlay and make it, make that wool look like that and I, it probably would have worked. But that was when birch bark was born, and I ended up using the thickener for birch bark. So everything kind of um, came full circle. What was the main cut used in the rug? Probably six, sevens for the most part. Um, but it goes, there's some fours and fives, um, but a lot of sixes and sevens for the most part, just to get that level of detail um, to it. It was necessary, to, you know, I couldn't go much bigger than that, but there was really no need to go much smaller. Um, we'll talk about the roofs in some of the other buildings. Some of those are eights. Um, and I'll talk about how I hook those because there's a special trick for that. <laughs> Kim says, do not break the speed limit in Pemberville. They mean 25, not 29. <laughs> Just saying. And it's interesting because I've had some students come in and they got stopped by the police. And this was back when we lived in town. You're not going to get that favor now, but we lived in town at the time. And the, the, they, you know, where are you going in such a hurry, ma'am? You know, oh, I'm going to Cindy Gay's. I'm going to a rug cooking class. Well, it turns out that was the officer who had actually knocked on my door, about gave me a heart attack 
because my son, my kids were still living at home. He knocks on the door and I'm like, oh, there's no reason for police to knock on your door except to tell you that your car that's parked on the street has been hit, which has happened, or that someone's in trouble or someone died. And I was just beside myself and I'm sweating bullets. And he opens the door and he's, ma'am, I'm really sorry to bother you, but your license plate? And I'm like, oh no, it's my car. My, your license plate says rug hook. And I'm like, yeah. He goes, my grandma used to rug hook. I was just wondering if it was the same kind. <laughs> And he came into my house. I showed him my rugs. I was very grateful that my family was okay. Um, and he was not there to deliver bad news. But that's what living in a small town is like. <laughs> um, does Beakers have a soda fountain? I don't know if they did at one time, but they do not now. Um, they do have often, oh, I haven't seen it the last few years. They used to have a cheese wheel. You could buy cheese off the cheese wheel. And a pickle barrel. You can buy pickles out of the barrel. Ah, yes, Diana, let me get that. Okay, so let's go through. There's only a couple more questions on the rug. Diana, I'm going to come back to that. Lily says, so the larger number is better detailed than smaller. No, the exact opposite. The number of the cut has to do with what 30 seconds of an inch. So an eight is eight thirty seconds. A three is three thirty seconds. So the smaller the number, the smaller the cut size, the more detail you can get in because you can change the color. Is there a lesson on your pine tree, pine tree on video somewhere? I don't think there is. Maybe there should be, but I don't think there is. I have the book, but I don't think... Mm, I might have taught maybe some of the old replays. It might be in the old replays, but I'm not sure. What size is the rug? It's roughly about three foot by five foot. And Dara was asking the same thing. It's roughly that. I don't remember exactly, but I always think of it, think of it as a three by five rug. And that's about the size. So Diana's question was, let's see if I can find it real quick. It was basically, do I ever um, hook some wool into a wool sampler? Here we go. Did you ever find when doing wool a wool sampler that you need to over dye the wool because you don't like it the way it hooked up? Yeah, you might when you're doing a wool sampler. Does everybody everybody know what that means? Let me grab one real quick. Oops, well, that's all I need is a fall on camera. Okay, so this is a wool sampler. And most of these wools are no longer available. This is the very first one I did. Um, but you take a piece of the wool and hook it and then lay a piece of it flat. There's something about doing this, which this will take you just a few minutes, right? Doesn't take you long at all. I do recommend sewing the flat one down first and then hooking. It just makes it a little bit easier. Um, plus, it's the part I don't like, and then that way it's over with. <laughs> and you don't have to get fancy with it. Big old stitches, just enough to hold it on there. So what if you hook it and you don't like it? Okay. It could be a good candidate then for over dyeing, and it might simply be a candidate for marrying. Marrying is where you put the wool in a pot, you fill it with water, heavy squirt of soap, you cook it until the dye comes out, and then put in acid, the dye goes back in, cook it for a good 30 minutes, let it cool in the pot overnight, ideally, and then wash and dry it. And that'll dramatically change it. If it just seems like it's a little too jumpy for you, that calms them down because it blends the colors. A little bit you don't have that um, wild change in value that you would have otherwise um, so that's one way of doing it and yeah sometimes that might be okay that's the one I don't like the way this looks but my friend Susie might love this and so it goes in you know and you put it in a special place and you know 
wait for the, the guild swap meet or whatever. You know, there's a lot of different things that you can do with it at that point. Lily says, what does that mean? 30 seconds of inch. Thir 30, it's 32 seconds of an inch. Okay, so this is not the best ruler for doing this, but there's a ruler, right? Each one of those little marks the, is a sixteenth of an inch, which is a half of a 30 second, <laughs> okay? So between, let's say here, let me get this on camera, between here and here, all of that is a number eight. There are only a few notations there, right? So two cut sizes, so you're gonna have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There, it's, it's a 30 second of an inch. So, um, let me put this in here in the comment. It's a fraction, 30 second of an inch, okay? So uh, equals, so a number, a number eight equals eight 30 seconds, okay? And a number four would equal four 30 seconds. Maybe on the text, I think that makes, um, makes a little bit, little bit, little bit more sense. Deborah says, if you didn't like it in an eight, could it look better in a four? Four. Now it depends on what you mean by you didn't like it. Was it too hard to pull up? Fours are easier to pull up because they're smaller. Different cut sizes will definitely give you different looks, particularly if you're using a texture. If you cut a texture too small, it becomes a solid. You don't see the variation. So you can actually do away with the variation in a texture by cutting it in a really small cut size but I think that's a whole nother lesson. So I think that's it for today. I think I got all the questions answered and hopefully, um, Lily, that makes sense on the 30 seconds of an inch. It's a fraction of an inch. Um, chances are there's a math video somewhere on YouTube that you could you know, get an explanation of what that means or just sit down with a ruler. You know, Here's an inch, here's a half. Here's a quarter, here's an eight, here's a 16, here's a 32nd. That's how small it is. So when we say it's a five or a six, it's a tiny difference. And a difference that you probably as a new beginner won't even be able to perceive. Um, it only That only comes with um, experience and expertise. So you don't need every cut size, you need like every other cut size, there's gonna be plenty, okay? That's it everybody. Thank you for being here. Hopefully I'll see you tomorrow at the hook-in. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go to my website, cindygayrughooking.com and register for the wool or for the rug hook-in. There's two places. There's a form that you can fill in where I can send out a notification to you if something happens and I can't make it to the hook-in. And then there's a green, I think it's green or yellow bar that you need to click where you register with Zoom. If you are a member of the rug hooking journey, just log into your dashboard. Don't worry about any of that. And just click on the wool, or I keep saying wool, click on the hook in at 4 p.m. tomorrow. You'll be in the right spot. That's it. Thanks everybody. See you next time.